Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we'll be looking at the second half of the Agatha Christie facsimile hardback collection published by Hachette back in 2012. So sit back, relax and let's take a look. Okay then, so we're going to be starting off with book 41, which is one of my favourites, Murder in the Muse here. And this is uh, got the four sort of shortish Poirot adventures in. And um, like all these books, uh, they're in the facsimile form there. And then they've got the uh, accompanying magazine as well. And um, there's not a great deal to these magazines. If you've seen the first part, you'll know they just give a little bit of uh, background to the story. Um, sometimes they feature, if the... Uh, book has been adapted into um, a, a particular movie or a play, something like that. Um, most of them have, of course. But it's not bad. It's just, you know, it just gives a another little dimension to it. Um, what was going on in the world at the time that the books were published. Um, pretty sort of standard fare, really. But, you know, you get these original, beautiful, beautiful treasure. That's one of my favourites. Um, as Alongside... Um, a little bit extra. Now, this is um, one of the later ones here, Caribbean Mystery. That Collins logo there. Still says a crime club choice, but this was uh, a later one. And um, in this video, we'll go right through to the very end, which uh, they published uh, an Agatha Christie autobiography um, at the very end, uh, which was quite a nice way to sort of round the series off. But these were all wartime releases, of course. That's where we're getting the wartime coverage. And um, after the last video, um, the rather superb website, Collecting Christie, um, the chat behind that actually uh, left a really, really informative comment on this series of books and the earlier jackets, which I just wanted to read to you now. So this is from the Collecting Christie website. So it says, read your comment about the jacket artist for Death on the Nile. In the mid to late 1930s, Agatha Christie's friend and archaeologist, Robin Mac McCartney designed the artwork for the dust wrappers stroke jackets for four of her books. Three of the jackets were logically given his involvement in various digs he went on with Christie and her husband, Max Mallowan. These were Murderer in Mesopotamia, which is 1936, Death on the Nile, 1937, Appointment with Death, 1938. However, the fourth was an outlier, Murder in the Muse from 1937, as it had no exotic locale to portray on the cover. So that was uh, really, really great. That Thank you very much for that. And um, of course, if you've never checked out the Collecting Christie website, I highly recommend it. They have uh, regular articles on all aspects of collecting Agatha Ath Christie. And uh, my love of the Christie paperbacks in particular, there's lots on there. And I've learned a lot from it from fellow Christie collectors. So I do recommend you heading, heading there if you can. Uh, right, next we have Lord Edgware Dies. Poirot again. Quite a moody sort of cover, this one. In fact, it's actually signed. Looks like it's signed Lambert. Huh. And this is uh, Charles Lawton in the play Alibi, which was adapted from Agatha Christie's Murder of Roger Ackroyd. Excellent. So, a very early rendition of Poirot there. Let's have a little look through the. Uh, the mag. So I've got a few other comments to read out as well about the uh, last series as we uh, as we work through these. Now this collection, sadly, is not mine. I don't own this uh, this run. These are my sister's, who's a huge Agatha Christie fan, and uh, she's uh, she's lent me these ones. And um, we actually had a, a couple of the tail end books missing because uh, uh, she was uh, in the process of moving house, and uh, they got. Uh, boxed up I think inadvertently but we've got them back now and uh, we're able to show the uh, the entire run. Um, Ordeal by Innocence, that's a bit of a more sort of arty decorative one rather than those beautiful earlier painted ones and you know it's just a reflection of the time that these were uh, being published and uh, the dust wrapper styles at the time. I do like the fact that they do include some of the uh, uh, other like paperback editions um, particularly my love of the pound ones. Um, I was thinking, you know, because I remember when Hachette published these, I actually wrote to the uh, Park Works distributor. I said, are you going to actually re-release it? This was about four or five years ago. And they said, no, we've got no plans to, to re-release this series. So already this run is 11 years old now as we film this. Um, and I also did a little bit of research because I've had some through my hands um, and others I've... Uh, 
never owned because you know i think they're just quite scarce published towards the end of the run and um when you have a look on places like eBay or Abe, the individual volumes, like an odd one, um, you know, tend to be between five and twelve pound per copy, which to me doesn't seem too bad. I mean, the actual magazine was five ninety nine when it came out, and they've all got that consistent five ninety nine cover price right through to the very end, which I think was an absolute bargain when you think about it, you know. Um, but nowadays, um, you do sometimes see full sets for sale. And um, there's two, as I film this, there's two full sets up on, on eBay, which are for sale in the UK. Uh, one of them is complete with all the magazines in the binders. So it's a full set, exactly what we've got here. And that's um, a thousand pounds, you know, or buy it now or best offer. So uh, you'd imagine they'd probably take off maybe 50 pound or a hundred or something for, a, you know, a full mint set. There's also a set, which is just the books on their own. Um, without the accompanying magazines or binders. It's just the books, and the books have, they show the slightest signs of wear. I would say they were like very fine rather than being like my sister's, which are virtually mint, you know, as, as published. Um, and that's a 580, which actually isn't too bad. It works out, what, about 650 a book, um, which isn't too bad. So that's up there now. I wouldn't recommend trying to piece these together book by book because um, you'll end up struggling I feel with the very tail end ones um, it's just just my opinion I don't think you know as a part work of this length went on chances are less and less people uh, carried it on to the very end um, inevitably some people got bored and you find that the very earliest books which admittedly there's some great ones in there but the earliest books definitely turn up more often than the tail end ones so it's just a little bit of buying advice that I've noticed um, and that's solely by looking at um, uh, uh, you know, completed auctions on eBay and what's available right now. That's Peter Davison there. Really like that design. Pocket full of right. Very, very nice. Yeah, 1953. I mean, it really does look 50s, that one, doesn't it? It's great. The Hollow. Now, this was, uh, um, wasn't this a play originally, this one? It was a play, wasn't it a play that was adapted into a book? I seem to remember something like that. I think somewhere in my collection I do have The Hollow, as a, um, but it's the theatre version of it, the play version of it, so that's maybe what I'm getting confused with. This is good, that reminds me a little bit of a, a Dell map back where they would have the scene of the crime on the back of the paperback. A bit of a gimmick, but one that I loved. And this is good because, you know, things like this, the, the, the theatre posters and that, I've just never seen these before. And uh, it's an area of Christie I don't know a lot about, all her uh, many, many stage adaptations. So uh, I like to see that sort of stuff. Now we got Sad Cypress. Another Poirot one there. Barlow was the uh, cover artist there. Didn't do a lot, did he? <laughs> a list of what was in print in two and six editions there on the back. So they would have been hardback prices at that point. Of course, a lot of the Christie's stayed in hardback a long, long time, not least of which for the libraries. Cypress, the pan jacket of that one. And then there's the Fontana edition. I have sort of been tempted to pull out all my Agatha Christie's, put the books in, in paperback, put the books into order, and then we could review like each book with the different editions that I've got. It would just be such a huge job and be such a long video, but I'm confident some of the books, I must have five or six different paperback editions or maybe more. I was having a little think because obviously they're now not going to um, reprint this series and the Festival of Britain in 1951. Big fan of uh, festival um, uh, imagery. He's got the famous logo there by Abraham Games, uh, the uh, British designer. And uh, I've got a few bits of festival stuff in my collection. I really, really like it. Uh, both my parents went to it as children. Uh, I think it would have been just really, really something. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying. So, yeah, I was... Uh, thinking what they would do since they're not going to do facsimiles of um the hardbacks again 
what would make a great series of facsimile hardbacks and I think I think there would be a market considering a lot of them are now 50 years old how about Harper Collins re-releasing the um, Tom Adams jackets how incredible would that be maybe sort of 10 at a time in a little box set something like that and they could release the whole lot I just think that would be uh, fantastic I'm certain they would sell those covers are so memorable um, I think they would be brilliant I like a lot of the uh, American ones as well but they're obviously quite tricky to track down these days and expensive generally when you find them in nice condition But yeah, if anyone at Collins is watching, how about a little little reissue of um, the, uh, the Tom Adams jackets? Right, the adventure of the Christmas pudding and a selection of entrees. <laughs> and these are the not so attractive to me, the sort of the more generic design jackets, this one. This one says published in 1934, this one, so... Uh, there you go, The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding. Darling of the West End. That's another theatre adaptation, a witness for the prosecution there. Coronation treats, we've just had another coronation, haven't we, in uh, the UK with King Charles. couple of Christmas ones didn't she and they're always uh, good to read if you're going to read one in, in uh, sort of Christmas week it'd be this one it? or uh, Hercule Poirot's Christmas now I'll just read another a viewer comment from the last video so this was from Ravi Busi and he says I recently finished my full set of these facsimiles would it make sense to put jacket covers on if I want them to last well I'm imagining that he is referring to the um putting like a plastic jacket on them and i would say yeah why not if you uh if you don't mind um you know taking the time to do it i've jacketed my sort of rarer first editions just to keep the jackets really nice and you can pick up big rolls of plastic wrap um uh, very easily in fact I, I usually have a link to the plastic wrap in my description so i try and remember to put one in the description of this video uh, sort of down below but um yeah Put them on, um, it'll make the jackets really pop out because it, it's almost like putting a mile of sleeve on them. They do look fantastic. But it'll be a big old job, but it would be very, very satisfying. And it, yes, it would definitely protect um, protect the dust jackets. It's as simple as that. Um, the, the main thing I would recommend with these is don't get them near sunlight because they've got these beautiful, beautiful, colourful spines and all the reds and oranges will just fade and they'll, they'll be awful. Um, the actual jacket... Um, the paper of the jackets themselves is almost like a buff quality. It's not glossy at all, which um, is more in keeping, I guess, with the original jackets as they were published. So um, if you were to put them in a plastic wrap, I think, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing at all, in actual fact. After the funeral, here's a destination unknown. The last Christie for Christmas was a pocket full of rye. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it would be a huge old job having to uh, do the whole lot, wouldn't it? All uh, sort of 80 or so, but uh, I think they would look really outstanding on the shelf if you were to do them. But all my sort of really vintage stuff, anything pre about 1975, you know, my hardback first, I've, I have got in, uh, in protective wrappers and... Uh, some actually later than that because they like key books like I got the wasp factory by Ian Banks which is um his first book and that can be that can be a bit pricey so even though it was like early 80s I've put that one in a wrapper um a protective sleeve rather you know mirror cracked there's another one there I like the fact that they've got all these uh theater bits and pieces in there so this is uh May 58 now, chronologically, when they're going through sort of her life story. Lovely. Now, now back to uh, a real beautiful jacket, this one, Hound of Death. 
and other stories. What a lovely one that one is, isn't it? And uh, what else was published at the time? Jungle Girl, Sun Will Shine. Um, I'm not sure if this was the Collins one, if this was the American jacket. I think it might be the American jacket, you know. Um, now I come to think of it. Original book jacket artwork, copyright Harper Collins. Hmm, it doesn't actually say. I'm sure one of the experts will be able to pipe in, probably collecting Christie. He'll let me know if that was the British or American jacket. Look at that. A photo of Christie there. I've seen that one before. With piles of her books there. <laughs> Imagine the author copy she must have been sent. And of course, this was around the time, um, well, in 1960, when Penguin were taken to court for publishing Lady Chatterley's Lover in a Penguin edition. It was uh, under the obscenity laws, and uh, they got a real selection of learned writers and journalists to stand up for Penguin. And Penguin ultimately won, and then printed an edition of 250,000 copies of Lady Chatterley. But the first of Lady Chatterley is surprisingly difficult to find, um, even though it had a run of 100,000. So, not sure what's going on there, but... If you see Lady Charlie in the Penguin edition, and it's the first Penguin edition, it's actually quite nice. So uh, there we go. Now we're on to They Do It With Mirrors. Once again, we've had more of a run of sort of the generic um, jackets rather than the really beautiful artistic ones. Um, it is just a reflection of when they were published. It's, uh, it's as simple as that really, isn't it? There she is. Look at that. Look at the pile of books she's signing there. Oh. Oh, to have one of those, eh? What is she? Which what is she actually signing? They look like paperbacks, don't they? But not one that I recognise. Maybe they're they're books, but they haven't had the jackets bound on yet. Possibly. Oh dear! Wow! 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 I'd love a signed Christie, but there seems to be so many uh, fakes and forgeries out there. Um, you know, unless you, you sort of happen to across one by accident that isn't being sold as a signed one. Um, I know there are signed uh, Penguin and Christie's out there, but when they turn up on the market, they tend to go for quite a few pounds, but she did sign them. And uh, she signed some for uh, Alan Lane as well, for his personal Penguin library. So you've got Hickory Dickory Dock. And there's a lobby card there from uh, Murder Most Foul. So each sort of magazine is working its way time-wise a little bit further. This is uh, 1963 and the start of Beatlemania. That's one of the American jackets, isn't it? That one up there. Very nice. I haven't got many of those uh, American ones. Now the 13 Problems, now this one's got the, the Collins Crime Club logo and it's like a generic logo with the, the hooded man there with his gun. And um, a few of the other Collins Crime Club authors of this period also had the same treatment. I guess they just didn't have time to, uh, to produce a dedicated jacket. But there we are, have you joined the Crime Club? I mean it's fa fantastic really, I think these are really, really nice. Good stuff. I would have joined the Colin Crime Club if I'd have been around back then. Thankfully, I've got quite a run of them in um, paperback now, and those are much, much cheaper. There we are. So it's mentioned in there the friendship of Alan Lane and um, Agatha Christie. I mean, Penguin themselves have got this fanciful story that um, Alan Lane was... Uh, had been visiting Agatha Christie in Torquay and he was waiting at Exeter Station to travel back to London and he was on the platform looking for something to read and uh, he didn't really want to buy a hardback he just wanted something for the price of a pack of cigarettes which was six pence at the time so apparently then he had the brainwave to come up with the uh, the Penguin books but that's that's the official Penguin story but obviously that's not actually true because Prior to that, in the two or three years before that, Alan Lane had toured Europe and he picked up loads of copies of the Albatross paperback library, which were colour coded just like the penguins. And uh, Alan Lane's penguins are an exact copy, even to the dimensions of those uh, European English language Albatross books, which were mainly published in, in Paris. Um, so 
that's what the penguins were based on, not this fanciful story that he suddenly had a brainwave at Exeter, Exeter Central Railway Station. But there you go, it's a nice story and it's, I guess it's good for publicity, but it's not actually true, um, not in a million years. Okay, passenger to Frankfurt. Um, his friendship with Agatha Christie definitely is though, and um, Agatha Christie uh, is, um, a, 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 you know, Mysterious Affair at Styles is, uh, was part of the first 10 penguins that were ever published so it's uh and obviously quite an expensive one today that one if you can uh if you've got a copy of the first edition alan lane of course published uh, a fair few of christie's books uh, uh, with his brothers at the bodily head a uh, prior to creating penguin books so uh he'd known her for quite a few years before penguin came along there we are so that's uh, passenger to frankfurt Lovely stuff. So number 60 now, so we're three quarters of the way through the entire collection. And um, as I said, I'll put a link to the first part just in case you want to see the first 40 um, in, the, uh, in the description down below. And also I'll link to it at the end. So here we are with By the Pricking of My Thumbs. That once again, very much a dust wrapper of the time that it was published. Let's see, it's got the original published name, 1968 for that one, which is super cool. And um, if this was my collection, um, I would rearrange the books, not in the order that they were published. I would, uh, not in the order that they were published in this Hachette part work. I would do it in the order that they were first, uh, first published um, chronologically in time. That is how I would have them on the shelf. And I think they'd look really, really fantastic. I must ask my sister how she shelves hers, if she does it to tie in with the actual release that they did with the magazines here, or if she has them in um, in published order, which I think, I don't know, I don't know, I shall ask her. Right, Poirot investigates, so almost like a photograph cover, obviously it's a painting there, but very, very unusual. It's an early one, as you can see, that's got the, uh, there we are, we were talking about Alan Lane, there's his dad there, John Lane, at the Bodley Head in Vigo Street, where uh, Penguin first started. And uh, they, of course, published Le Ariel, which was the very first Penguin book. It's Penguin number one. So this is an early one. Let's see. This must be uh, is it late 20s, early 30s. Look at that. 1924. There we are. So yeah, one of the very earliest ones. Can imagine how much this one is in uh, first edition hardback. Dame Agatha. I love that photo of her there with her arms crossed. It's fantastic. Decimal now, so we're at 6970, aren't we? Coming in on to the end of Agatha's life. But she's still had a few years left in her yet. There's uh, Nigel Bruce and uh, Basil Rathbone there, my, my one of my favourite teams for uh, Sherlock Holmes. Very much a big fan of those, particularly the uh, the radio episodes that were came out in the 1930s and 40s. Here's a favourite of mine, Death Comes as the End. Great one, this one. That's the original jacket to it. Very, very nice. I, I would really, really like one of these as an original, but I guess we're talking a few hundred pounds at a minimum, really, aren't we? And I've got the Panda, a particularly nice edition of it, which I really like. And uh, I believe there's a nice pocket one as well. I may even have them in here. seventies now. Yeah, I love all these sort of Egyptology references. Here we are, that's the that's the one. I do actually have that one and, and there's the pan. So I have got, you know, a couple of really, really great covers. I've got that pocket one. I got it uh, earlier this year in fact um, from Zardos Books. So I was very pleased to get that. Uh, brilliant. So another great great one now, the mysterious Mr. Quinn. I really, really like this one. Um, yeah, excellent stuff. A great cover that one is, isn't it? This is the last one of this folder as well, number 63. So, it's about 1974 stroke 75 now in her life. Yeah, 
Nixon near the White House. Backstory to this particular one. Yeah, hollow grenade. Excellent. Right, let us get out the next binder. Okay, so here we are, the last of the four binders, and this starts with number 64, which is Mrs. McGinty's Dead. Really like that jacket. I like the little silhouette of uh, Poirot in the bottom corner there as well. Very, very nice. Here we are, so it says, during 1975, the decline in Agatha's health became unmistakable. But in her difficult final months, she was sustained by her happy family life and firm religious faith. After her death, her books, stories and plays live on well. I mean, who would have thought, I wonder if she would have even thought that she would have been this popular over 50 years after, um, you know, after her uh, last books were published. I mean, really, I don't, I, um, we know she had a massive revival during um, uh, lockdown. She became very, very popular again. But I just feel there's, we could, it could be taken to the other level. And uh, I think the publishers really need to step up. I think the current offering by Collins is very, very dry and, and dour. And it needs to sort of play up and add a bit more excitement to it. And I just don't think that's that's really happening. Um, and that's why something exciting like the uh, a reissue, say, of the Tom Adams covers would be, I just think, fantastic. Partners in Crime. Brilliant, another one, that really early one as well. A bit more on the back there as well. Versatile, Agatha Christie, writer of thrills. Excellent novels by this clever author include. <laughs> Good stuff. There we are, so yeah, news of her death spread quickly across the globe. I remember it when I was a youngster. Um, there was a few notable deaths Around this time, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, Elvis Presley, I remember. These were all big deaths that I remember at the time, and uh, Christie was no different. She was, uh, was all over the news, very much celebrated, as we know. Lovely. And then we got They Came to Baghdad. Once again, a bit more of a topographical cover there. Still got the, the nice Crime Club logo there. Well, perhaps one of the, the greatest ensemble cast films of uh, the 70s, wasn't it? Death on the Nile. And uh, very similar to what um, they're trying to do today with the new Poirot movies, of course. Let's have like an ensemble cast. So nothing new. So now that they've sort of covered all the years of Christie's life, they're coming. Uh, they're sort of covering uh, other different aspects of her life now. You know, Cat Among the Pigeons. Another really interesting jacket. That one. That classic photo there on the back. Number sixty-seven in the series. Diana Rigg there, from Death on the Nile. And brilliant. These uh, magazines, they do vary in quality. Some of them have got really interesting stuff in, other ones not so much. But these tail end ones do seem a little bit more interesting than, um, than the later ones. There we are, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. I think there has to be a market for reissuing the uh, the Tom Adams jackets, in my opinion. Slip those over there. Now I'm on my last little pile here. We're on book number 68, the the Pale Horse, Crime Club choice. And these dish, I have to say, they just feel so good in the hand. They're not massive big tomes because Christie's books generally weren't like that. None of them are that long, but they just. Yeah, eminently readable and uh, you do get that sort of retro feeling I think when uh, when you go through one of them Excellent. 
and stuff. Now we're on to third girl. I just want to pause there. I got one more comment I wanted to uh, relay to you. And this was from um, T and Morty on YouTube. So he says, this is about the first video. He says, thanks for this. I've got all of these. And my plan when it started was to read them in original publication order, which is what I would do, which I did. But I had to wait almost three years to start as the two chimneys books were among the last in the part work. Right. I also got framed prints of the four McCartney covers. Murder in Mesopotamia is probably my favourite cover of all. Well, I'm not arguing with that. It is, it's definitely up there in my top five for the original hardback jackets, I think. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, lots and lots of interest on that one. And I hope, um, you know, I hope these... Christy videos, the occasional Christy videos. I try and come up with something on her once every couple of months, in all honesty. Um, different aspects of, of collecting Christy. Um, I'm not sure what the next one's going to be. Um, I said it may be. I pull out all the Christies from my collection and um, show the different editions that I've got for the individual stories. I think that might be fun and seeing the different sort of styles. Nemesis. There we are. She's a ball of wool there. Very modern marble. Oh, ah, yeah, this is the Geraldine McEwen series. I think they were great. I really enjoyed, I mean, I know they're not strictly to the, by the book, but I enjoyed the way that they were modernised, as it were. An absolutely fantastic cast in uh, almost every episode had some really great, great actors in them. Really, really great. I certainly enjoyed um, my one. Um, but there was uh, lots of really good ones in there. Because they're historical, which they don't go out of date. I've actually been re-watching the David Suchet Poirots, because there's lots of those that I didn't see at the time. And uh, they've been fantastic. And of course, they're all on um, Britbox. So they're easy to, uh, easy to access. Labours of Hercules. There's a nice famous one, isn't it? Mentioning Poirot on the front as well, starring Hercule Poirot. Um, the Poirot and Marples are obviously amongst the most uh, famous of all. Some Joan Collins there. Recently turned 90, incredibly. To a really early one now, a bodily head one. This is uh, the secret of chimneys. Now, uh, this is the one that my friend just referred to there. T and Morty, 1925. This one, oh, lovely, isn't it? Now I may be wrong, but I mean we're at the period now where potentially Collins could release centenary editions, which is uh, what's happened with like the Peter Rabbit books, and as they were coming out, um, and they are Collins as well, I believe. No, they're not Collins, are they? They're, um, oh, I can't remember the Peter Rabbit publisher, but what they did, they released the, uh, the hardbacks with like gold jackets, which are really, really nice. I just think, um, they should go back and re release those Tom Adams ones. That would be my, uh, my suggestion. But, you know, they could do it for the next few years, just release a, like a hundredth anniversary hardback edition, possibly. Something that the, uh, Christie collectors, I'm sure, would like to do. Maybe even re-release them in facsimile form, similar to this, but maybe like a boxed slipcase sort of hardback, uh, similar to the uh, the James Bond facsimiles. They would be quite nice, wouldn't they? Make sure we got these all in picture here. So we got the Seven Dials mystery, number seventy-three. Not quite near the end now. A bit more about. Her life. Scene of the crime. Lucky number seven. Lovely. Another great one here. Elephants can remember. Seem to remember borrowing this one um, from the library in the, the late 70s. I was very keen to go 
I was very keen. I used to go to the library quite a bit and borrow Christie books because um, there were so many. And I remember taking this one out. This is 1972. I'm sure it was in that jacket as well. So it was probably the original library edition that had been knocking around there for a few years. There we are, the mousetrap there celebrating its 60th anniversary at that point. six final cases and um, they've added the, the six in there and two other stories quite a thin little volume this so it's uh, six superb short stories featuring Miss Jane Marple there we are she's been doing her knitting <laughs> there's uh, Greenaway yeah, owned by the National Trust Lovely. And then we got uh, Curtain, which was uh, Poirot's last case. It's a good one. Once again, I remember borrowing this one from the library and very much enjoying it. It's got a great twist at the end, as so many of them do have. There we are inside Greenaway. There's the paperback of her autobiography published by Fontana. I haven't actually got that one. I'm just trying to track a copy of that one down in the original Fontana library. Curtain. That was a good one, that one. The Listerdale Mystery. Excellent, that one with the uh, the torchlight there, the flashlight. It's again a fairly early one, this, is it? Um, yeah, 1934, this one was first published. I've never read it was one of the more recent ones wasn't it problems at Pol Polensa Bay and um, of course it's got the original jacket this is how it was printed by HarperCollins at the time so when did this one first get published 1991 yeah I never read this one um, yeah some old favorites featuring this exquisite selection of short stories from Agatha Christie a reunion with the uh, Statistician and problem solver Mr. Parker Pine, the mysterious Mr. Harley Quinn, the love detective, and of course, the incomparable Hercule Poirot. Well, there we are. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that these were all uh, uncollected short stories that they pulled, pulled together from uh, various sources. That is my suspicion. But once again, I'm sure someone in the... Uh, Christie collecting community will be able to fill me in on the, the history of the, the problem at Polen Polenza Bay because it's a story, uh, a title I'm unfamiliar with. Well, there we are, there's some nice Dell editions. I haven't got any of those. They're the Mary Westmacott ones, I bet they're scarce. I bet they are rare. Uh, stuff and we got poster and a fate this was another tail end one wasn't it is it 70s this one i seem to remember yeah 1973 there we are there's an american uh, 
American penguin there. You don't see those very often. They're all quite expensive these days. I've got a couple of them, but not many. Yeah, it looks like they're just rounding out the series, aren't they? And then uh, we've got uh, another more recent one, While the Light Lasts. This is uh, another one that I've never read, a brand new collection of unpublished stories by the Queen of Crime. So these are unpublished then. Not, um, they've unearthed seven new stories, most of which have never been published anywhere in the world. Oh, since their original appearances, plus early magazine versions. So, yeah, I would imagine you know, she did write for magazines and things like that. And that's probably what this has come from. They've pulled them together. But why not in the name of, um, you know, consistency and having everything that she ever wrote in print? These should be uh, brought out again, you know. Lots of familiar ones here. So a lot of modern crime authors were uh, influenced partly by Agatha Christie. You couldn't fail not to be, I would think, if you uh, if you write crime today. You know, you must have uh, read some of her her books at some point. And now we got these tail end ones. This is the last handful. Now the last five, and these are um, sort of uh, the plays. And I would imagine that these are uh, put together, you know, just in the name of completeness more than anything. Um, so what does it say about the publishing history of this one? Copyright 1940. Um, and this edition published in this one in 1993 for the mousetrap. So imagine it's going to have, is it going to have mousetrap related content? Well, a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, one of the very longest uh, plays in the West End, if not the longest, I guess. So that was the mouse trap. Then we got the next one, which is considerably thicker, which is Appointment with Death and other plays. Four acclaimed stage thrillers in this one. So, and then there were none, Appointment with Death and The Hollow, so the three. As I said, I used to have The Hollow in a play form, and that must be what's reprinted in here. I just can't remember the uh, the play um, publisher I've got it in, but it's like a B-format softback. Quite generic jackets on these, of course. Uh, witness for the prosecution and selected plays. Another big, thick one. This has got what plays are in this one, then. Witness for the prosecution towards zero verdict. Go back for murder. Look at that. That's probably the biggest one in the entire um, series here. Trying to slide these in picture a bit more. I think they must have reprinted almost every Tom Adams cover during this run, you know. But why not? And a fair few of the pan ones as well. Very nice. And then the part work series itself was rounded out with a two volume autobiography. So they're quite sort of generic covers here. And uh, here we are. So what does it say about this? Agatha Christie, an autobiography, copyright 1977. And this leads from, well, from her birth up to uh, part five, it says, is war. And uh, a good way to finish the series, this was uh, the, uh, the autobiography. So this is the very sort of last one now. And it lists the books, if you wanted to, you could now put your collection in order because it's virtually complete. Just the one volume to go, and they show all the ones here, so you could shelve them in order, which is exactly what I would do if I owned these little beauties. I put them in uh, published order. There we are. Then the very, very last volume is the second volume 
of her uh, autobiography, part two. And this is uh, the, see the second part of her life there, going through the Second World War, and then that's the 50s, 60s, and 70s at the end. And this last bit of the part one magazine is an index to all the previous 84 issues, so it's just like a guide to them there. And there we are, that's in published order as well. Good stuff, eh? There we are, the Agatha Christie Books Collection in its entirety. Brilliant. So there you go, I hope you enjoyed looking through that complete collection of the fantastic Hachette Agatha Christie Facsimile Book Collection. An absolutely superb series to collect. As I said, I personally wouldn't want to collect these piecemeal. I'd like to try and buy um, a full set or a very near full set with just a couple to, to fill in. I wouldn't want to try and pick these off one by one. I think it would be quite a tough old job. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this video today. Do please give it the thumbs up if you have. Do please consider subscribing if you've not already for regular vintage Agatha Christie content. And I'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.